Well, we're all back once again, those of you watching by DVD and those of you in the classroom. As we continue to session 38, this one will focus on prophecy and tongues and will be in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. In our last session, we talked about the motivation for serving is love. And we took a look at the very favorite passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 13. I mentioned that while it's used in wedding ceremonies, it's not really about marriage. It's about the motivation of spiritual gift. But since it's the best written definition, explanation, description of love ever given, it's used in many contexts as well as it should. In this session, as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we'll spend this session and next session unpacking some important truths about cautions that Paul gives related to the use of the gifts of prophecy and the gifts of tongues. And the most important point that Paul makes in this chapter is prophecy is more important to the church than tongues. So would you open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now imagine that someone came into this room and stood in the front, looked at the camera and looked at all of you and said, now, I am not making fun of the gift of tongues, but I would like you to compare that little <laughs> demonstration with this demonstration. Suppose that same person came in, looked at the camera, looked all of, at all of you and said instead, Brothers and sisters, I have a word from the Lord for you. And he wants you to know how very pleased he is that you have been studying so diligently about spiritual gifts. And his message to each of you is this. Serve others in love. Identify your gift. Use your gift to build up the body of Christ. Be faithful in serving others and you will be blessed. Now that person was using the gift of prophecy. The first person was using the gift of tongues, which I have mentioned I do not have. Which of those two messages was more helpful for you? They were identical messages. What I said in, supposedly said in tongues, was meant to be the identical message I said in prophecy. So which one was more beneficial? Which one helped you the most? Which one did you understand? I'm guessing it was the second message on prophecy. And that's Paul's main point. Prophecy is more important than tongues because we can understand what the person is saying in prophecy. The only way we understand the gift of tongues is if someone there with the gift of interpretation. There are three main points in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. One is, prophecy is of greater value to the church than tongues. Second, it's understanding the message that's the most important thing. And third, tongues is meant for unbelievers. Prophecy is meant for believers. And we're going to look at each of those three points as we unpack all of this uh, material in 1 Corinthians 14. In this session, we're going to go from uh, verse 1 down to verse 25. And in the next session, we'll begin with verse 26 and we'll take a look at verse 40. Well, some background about the Corinthian church is helpful. They were misusing their spiritual gifts. In fact, too many people were using their gifts in the Corinthians church and it was creating confusion in the church during their worship services. Moreover, people were speaking and nobody had any idea what they were saying because someone was not interpreting the message. And then, uh, moreover, those people who had the gift of tongues were trying to present themselves as being a little above everyone else who didn't speak in the gift of tongues. 
And now the Corinthians have written a letter to Paul in which they've asked a number of questions and 1 Corinthians includes his answers to those questions. One of the questions was to ask about how do we properly use spiritual gifts. So when we come to the very first verse, he, he transitions out of this discussion about love to this discussion about tongues and, and uh, prophecy by saying, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Now some people read that verse and they claim that you should pray for the gift of prophecy. I don't think that's what it's saying. This is a letter that is written to the church. It's not written to an individual. It doesn't say you should pray for the spiritual gift. What it's saying is that all of you should follow the way of love, which I've just talked about, and all of you should eagerly desire that God has given you prophets in your midst, that you would have prophet, prophets in your church who could exercise their gift of prophecy. So it's not saying to us, pray and ask God for the gift of prophecy. What it is saying is, pray that God would give in your congregation people who have the gift of prophecy, the gift of imparting messages that God wants the church to hear. And then he goes on and he compares prophecy and tongues. And I have written on the chalkboard just a little side-by-side -side comparison of what he discusses here and I wanted to go through it. So as we go into verse 2, he says, For anyone who speaks in tongues, he does not speak to men, but to God. Person speaking in tongues, it's the language of God. He's speaking to God. And the only way men can understand it is if someone with the gift of interpretation is there. So that's his first point, why it's not as important to the church as prophecy is. And then he goes into verse 3, I'm sorry, the next part of verse 2. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. But everyone who speaks prophecies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. He says, with tongues, you're speaking to God. With prophecy, you're speaking to men from God. The church doesn't understand you if you're speaking in tongues, at least not without an interpreter. But when prophecy, the church understands. And they are strengthened, they're encouraged, they are comforted. The point is, side-by-side -side comparison, which is more important? Which is more valuable? Which is more beneficial to the church? Obviously, prophecy. And he finishes up by saying, he who speaks in tongues edifies himself. They build themselves up. Uh, they themselves are the ones who are growing. And no one else is built up except there's a, if there's interpretation. But he says, he who speaks in prophecy you're building up the church, and the church is growing. He says, I'd like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. Now, why would he say he wants everyone to speak in tongues? I think it's because tongues is a sign language to unbelievers. And if everyone had the gift of tongues, think about how many opportunities there would be through tongues for people to come to Christ. Instead, he's saying here that I'd rather have you prophesy because look at all of the things that happens there. Men are hearing your words and they're understanding it. They're strengthened and comforted, built up, and the church grows as a result. So all in all, when you come to the bottom line, he says prophecy is far better. In fact, uh, he says... He who prophesies is greater than one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. His first point, prophecy is far more beneficial to the church than tongues. In fact, later he's going to come back and end with, tongues weren't really meant for the believers. 
tongues were meant for the unbelievers. Prophecy wasn't really meant for unbelievers. Prophecy was meant for the believers. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com. So then he goes on, and this next whole section, beginning in verse 6, is where he talks about the real important thing is that you understand what somebody is saying. It's not what they said in, in the words, it's whether you understand what the words meant. And so he, he makes this clear. He goes on. Now, brothers, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Again, he's emphasizing you can't do that with tongues, at least without an interpreter. He says, when I prophesy, you'll be brought some revelation, which means the prophet will give you some insight to the Word of God, or knowledge that you will be instructed in the Word of God, or prophecy, you will come to understand hidden meanings, mysteries, the truths that God wants to reveal, or a word of instruction that we might grow up in the faith. He says, even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, such as a flute or a harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? As a good teacher, he uses some examples again. First, he uses an example of the flute and harp, and then he goes on to talk about the trumpet call that sounds people to battle. And here he says, if you're sitting and listening to someone playing the fruit, a flute, unless you can distinguish the notes, you're not going to enjoy the tune. The notes are the words. The tune is the meaning of the, of the notes, of the words. So he's saying, when I go there and I listen to somebody playing, I both have to hear the notes in order to appreciate the overall tune itself. And when you speak in tongues, I don't hear that distinguishing note sound. I don't even understand what notes are being played. So how is it that I could know the whole tune, the meaning of it? Instead, when you speak in prophecy, the notes are very crisp and very clear, understandable, and the overall meaning is understood and appreciated. And then he goes on to give a second illustration. He says, again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? In ancient times, a trumpet sounded and that rallied everyone to battle. And he's saying that if a trumpeteer, person blowing the trumpet, doesn't sound the trumpet clearly, <laughs> instead of doo -doo 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 -doo, then nobody's going to rally to the cause. It's, what was that? <laughs> Did he sound the trumpet? I don't know. Did you hear it? Nobody will rally to the cause. And he's giving both parts here. When you talk about the, the uh, flute and the harp, he's saying that is when there is beautiful music being played. That is when we're together at the body of Christ and there's just real enjoyment in being together and being with God. And prophecy allows that to happen. Tongues does not. And then when he goes on to the trumpet, he's saying, but there are times that Christ will call you to battle as a church. That there is a problem, there's an issue that you must take on and the trumpet is sounded and prophecy sounds the trumpet clearly. Tongues is the one that sounds that nobody can understand. So he's used two examples and then he goes on and says in verse 9, so it is with you Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you're saying? I mean, when I first began this session and I supposedly spoke in tongues, it was 
unintelligible. You had no idea what I was saying. And that's what happens when only tongues are spoken. However, when prophecy is spoken, you understand what I'm saying because the words are intelligible. And that's his point. You got to understand it to have it have any benefit. He goes on in verse 9 to say, you'll just be speaking to the air. You might as well just be there and just talk and nobody else is going to pay any attention to you. See, there is some humor in the Bible. You know, Paul is just saying, you're just standing there talking to the air. And then he goes on and he says in verse 10, Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. I don't even have a clue how many foreign languages are, there are in the world. I know that there's 120 some nations in the world. And assuming that all of them have some sort of native language, there are at least 120. But then in many countries, you have multiple languages. In African countries, you have multiple tribes in every nation. There could be thousands of languages spoken around the world. But, Paul says, no matter what language is being spoken, each word does have some meaning to the person who speaks that language. To others, it's unintelligible. And so he goes on to say, if then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker and he's a foreigner to me. So tongues is an unintelligible language. But he says the example also holds true if you speak a real foreign language where the words have meaning to the people who speak the language. And Paul is saying if he doesn't speak the language, I might as well be a foreigner to you because you know what you're saying but I don't know what you're saying. So we never really understand each other. We never really connect. We never really come to the point where we can become brothers. And in this case, he is not demeaning tongues. He's not demeaning foreign languages. He's just saying, you have to understand it to have it have any value whatsoever. Tongues without an interpreter has no value to the church. A foreign language, un unintelligible to a person who doesn't know that language, while it has meaning, doesn't mean anything to the person who doesn't know the language. In verse 12 he continues, so it is with you. Since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in gifts that build up the church, such as prophecy. So he began in the first section from verses 1 to 5, and he does this side-by-side -side comparison between prophecy and tongues. And he says, all right, now look at the two side-by-side. -side. Which one makes more sense? Prophecy is the one you're going to understand. Tongues, you're not going to know what it means. It's going to build up the church with prophecy. It's only going to serve the individual with tongues. Then he goes on to verse 6 and down to verse 12. And he says, so the main thing is understand the meaning. With tongues, you don't. With prophecy, you do. With tongues, it's like a flute or a harp played, but you can't distinguish the notes. Or it's like a trumpet being sounded, but the call is not clear. And therefore, nothing happens as a result. It was not understood. And then the final example is foreign languages. It has meaning. People who speak that language know it, but unless you speak it, you're not going to understand it. And even the person speaking tongues, unless that person has the gift of interpretation. Even they don't understand what they're saying. So he's saying, when you lay it all out there, side by side by side, prophecy is so much more important than tongues. And he's really uh, slapping the wrists of the Corinthians saying, you're putting too much focus on tongues. Stop it. Tongues is not what is important to the church. Tongues is what's important to get the message out to unbelievers. Instead, excel in the spiritual gifts that will build up the church, which would be tongues. He then comes down into the uh, last portion. He says in verse 13, For this reason, anyone who speaks in tongues should pray 
that he may interpret what he says. This is the only time we mention that there's any uh, encouragement to us to actually pray for a spiritual gift. And only those who have tongues are encouraged to pray for it. And this relates to what he's just said. If you speak in tongues but you don't have the gift of interpretation and no one else does, absolutely no one knows what's being said, including you. So we'll pray for the gift of interpretation. So if you do have the gift of tongues, you also might explain the message to the church. This is the only time where someone is encouraged to pray for a spiritual gift. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfaithful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. He's saying tongues might generate emotion in the church, but prophecy feeds the mind. Tongues gets everybody all excited in the church. Prophecy gets everyone instructed in the church. So he's bringing this home uh, for his last points. If you are praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving since he does not know what you're saying? You may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. Finally, he says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Paul spoke in tongues. It was one of his gifts. Those who say that gifts are not for this generation, I mean, we're looking at the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament. He spoke in tongues. Although he does not say it here, my guess is he used it primarily for his personal worship with the Lord where he communicated in the language of heaven to praise God. He says, but in the church, I'd rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in tongues. If I could just speak five words that you understand, that would be better than me speaking 10,000 words that you didn't understand. That makes sense to me. Going back to the beginning, I spoke more, uh, less than 10,000 words in tongues, but you didn't understand it. But I spoke a few words in English, and you did understand it. And those who are hearing it translated, you understood it. So he finishes up with, Brothers, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants. Be in your thinking uh, adults, in the law it's written, though men of strange so tongues and those with the lips of foreigners, through them I will speak to this people, but even then they will not listen to me because they don't understand it. And then he gets to his third point. His first was prophecy is of greater value than tongues. The second one, it's all about understanding. You have to understand in order for it to have any benefit. And this final section from 22 to 25 is, and tongues is for unbelievers, prophecy for believers. Tongues then are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not unbelievers. So if the church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues, and some who do not understand, or some unbelievers come in, Will they not say that you are out of your mind? When I began speaking those nonsense words at the beginning of this session, and I looked at the faces of the people in the classroom, they all looked like, are you crazy? What are you saying? Why are you speaking that way? Imagine if somebody comes into your church who has never been there before, and in your church, somebody stands up and begin, begins speaking in tongues. I think that person would, as fast as possible, turn around and run out the door. These people are nuts. They're crazy. Listen to the goofy language they're speaking. Then Paul goes on to say, But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in 
while everybody is prophesying, he will be convicted by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all. And the secrets of his heart will be laid bare, so he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. In the case where someone who does, is not part of your church, a visitor, comes in, and someone is bringing a message from God through the gift of prophecy, it's very possible that God will use that message to convict him, to sh lay open his heart before him to say, you are a sinner, and bring him to the point of salvation, and bring him to the statement that surely God is among these people. Now contrast that with tongues where they said, are you people out of your mind? with God is really among you. Paul is not saying that tongues have no place in the, in the church. He is saying it doesn't have a place above prophecy in the church. Prophecy is of greater value because people understand it and because it will help the church grow up. Tongues has a place in the church if there is someone who can interpret. If not, don't speak in tongues. But its greater value is in preaching the gospel to those who don't know, know Jesus Christ. Well, next session, we will continue on and we will take a look at how should the Corinthians and how should our churches have orderly worship. One of the problems was there was too much confusion too much disorder in the Corinthian church. And so now Paul says, here are some ground rules. This is how you should operate as a church in order to make sure that it is not confusing, that it honors God, and that people benefit from their time at church. So please join us for the next session on 1 Corinthians 14, 26 through 40 on orderly worship. Thank you for joining us.